We come now before you in this time of worship to prepare ourselves to hear from your word. Father, it is my prayer that we are ready to receive your word. We allow it to transform our lives and, and ultimately transform this church so we have a clear vision of what you are calling us to do. Teach us this morning. Let not this time go to waste, but allow it to challenge us change us, to equip us for what you want us to do. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, I pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Eric, get to your side of the table. You know, I'm sitting here, and this is the only thing that comes up to my mind, is I'm the little kid at the big kid table for Easter, or for Easter, for Easter, or Thanksgiving, whichever. Whatever the case is, yeah. So, yeah, it, so now I've got that image. I apologize. Yeah, I kind of feel like the cookie monster is going to pop up in the middle of the table here that we're going through our ABCs this morning. But we are here, and we're thankful to be here. We're thankful that you're here this morning, and we want to talk about uh, where we're going. What will our church look like in a year? What will the building look like? Who's going to be in the seats during our services? Are we going to have to have multiple services because we're just too full and we've ran out of room? Are we thinking about building and adding to our building? Are we thinking about staying here? Are we thinking about moving? Is the youth ministry vibrant and do we have to have multiple people helping with youth because there's just so many youth in and out of the church? The children's ministry, are the children's ministry going to be packed Are we going to have to figure out how we have space for all of our kids? Are we going to have to deal with people complaining because a kid put crayon on the wall or is running through the sanctuary? These are all questions we're asking. Will we be producing disciples for the kingdom of God? Will we be sending out future pastors and missionaries? Will the church be living up to the vision that Jesus has for it, or will it not? All good questions that deserve to be answered. And make no mistake, God has the answers for us, and God has a plan for us as a church. And if we're obedient to Him and to His plan, God will do amazing things with this body of believers. As we start this journey, we need to be rooted in Jesus and Jesus alone. Eric and I were going back and forth through this, and, and we didn't know exactly what we were going to preach on, but we knew we wanted to kind of tag team this Sunday, so I'll be doing a couple points, and he will, and that's why they're both up here, and if he gets out of line, I'll smack him around because Eric usually gets out of line, and he's inappropriate up here, okay? I'm the serious one, all right? Yes, exactly. But we both knew we needed to be in the book of Acts. I love when God works like that. Now, we were in different chapters in Acts, but we both knew we needed to be in the book of Acts this morning. So if you have your Bibles, we landed in Acts chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 19. And the book of Acts, in a lot of ways, is a series of turning points in the life of the early church. So we can compare it to the life as we start our church and as we move forward. We can see the things that happen in the book of Acts and we can see the promises given to us in the book of Acts and we can rely on God moving. We see in the book of Acts the ascension of Christ, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the stoning of Stephen, the conversion of Saul. We see this as every page we turn, we see this history unfolding right before our very eyes. In this chapter of the gospel, we see how the gospel started to be shared with all people, both Jews and Gentiles. Acts eleven nineteen through 26 goes like this. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks as well. 
preaching the good news of the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a considerable numbers were added to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers of people And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Talking about establishing our roots this morning. What do our roots look like? How do we start this process of uh, of relaunching? How do we start uh, this process of replanting? And the first thing we must understand as we do this church family, and I'm going to refer to us as one church family because that's what we are, We're no longer two church families. We're one church family. So I'm going to get rid of the us and them and replace it with we from here on out. Amen? Amen. The first thing we must do is make a choice to replant and not transplant. We're at such a critical time in our church, perhaps one of the most critical times that our church has ever faced. And it's not because of dissension. It's not because of problems. It's not because of anything in that nature. We're at a critical time because we're at a crossroads in our church. We're at a crossroads in our church because we're going to have to make some very impactful decisions. Now, I'm happy with the people that attend this church. I'll be honest with you. I love you all. You all are family to me. That's just just the way it is. You're, You're family. Whether you like it or not, I'm Cousin Eddie. So I'm coming over for Thanksgiving, and I'm kicking, taking my shoes off, and you are going to have the feet smell and everything that goes with it. I'm not. I promise I won't do that. But I'm blessed to be your pastor, and Pastor Eric feels the same way. Because I believe within the heart of this church, there's a genuine desi- desire for people to be disciples and to make disciples and to carry out the Great Commission. But what can happen if we're not careful in doing the day-to-day? What can happen if we get uh, into a mode where we have all this stuff to do and we lose sight of why we're doing it, which is very easy to do when you have a big old page and a laundry list of stuff that has to be done and you want to get it done in a certain amount of time. It can be very, very easy for us to get into a mode where we make the choice to transplant instead of replant. See, transplanting is like moving to a new house because your house is dirty. Transplanting is like moving to a new house and saying, okay, I'm moving to a new house because I didn't do any maintenance on my old house and my house is all broken down, so I need to move to a new house. That's what transplanting is. And we need to be careful that regardless of what Regardless if you came from the journey, regardless if you came from Richmond, regardless if you came from uh, Creef Corps, regardless of where you come from, we need to understand that we need to replant and not transplant. There's some ministries we do that are vibrant and that are good, and we need to continue on doing those and continue to evaluate those ministries so they can be done better. But there are things we do that we're going to have to stop. There are things that, 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 that we do that we simply can't stay the course. There's things that we do that are broken and ineffective. We can't afford to be 10, 15, 20 years behind what culture's doing. We can't afford to do that. Well, well, uh, pastor, in in order to do something that culture's doing, that means you're not going to preach Jesus? No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. We're going to talk about that. But we need to be relevant to the times we live in. And see, transplanting is hard But replanting is a whole lot harder. It's a whole lot harder. Because whenever we face any kind of opposition, whenever we face anything that's new to us, I don't know if it's just me, but I don't think it's me. I think it's really all of us. Whenever we face something new, it makes us uncomfortable. And we want to default back to to whatever we did before. 
Even if those things aren't effective, we default back to that because it brings us comfort. I'm here to tell you, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, in 2021, at the journey, you are uncomfortable. Because it isn't our job to make you comfortable. That went over well. Yeah. Yeah. We've done a lot of good things as churches. We'll continue to do those. But we see that COVID has forced us and every other church in this country to really evaluate what we're doing and how we're doing it. Churches are closing at a record number. You can drive down this street and see at least one church that's closed. That's a reality of what we're living in. And it's forcing us to face what we're facing. And you know what, church family? That isn't a bad thing. That isn't a bad thing at all. You look at verse uh, 19 and 20 again. It says, uh, so, so then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks as well, preaching the good news of the Lord Jesus. This verse is huge. Circle it, underline it, highlight it if you have your Bibles with you. It's a very important verse because up until this very moment, the gospel was only preached to the Jews. So you have these men coming in who had to be uncomfortable, but you have these men coming in and they start teaching the gospel to the Gentiles as well. Different groups of people that don't look like them or act like them or have the same culture as them. Nonetheless, they start preaching the gospel to them. That had to be hard. I remember the first Sunday I come here, it was incredibly hard to come here. And there's brothers and sisters in Christ, but it's incredibly hard to come in here and preach. Eric, I'm sure, felt the same way. It's uncomfortable. You're a new group of people. You don't know how it's going to be. I have a really weird sense of humor. So half the people take that well, and the other half the people look at me like I'm insane. And it was true the first week I was here. Only three-quarters of the people thought I was insane. (laughs) But look at verse 21. It says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. I firmly believe that is a promise from God that if we choose to replant instead of transplanting, we will see a large number number of people turn to the Lord. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And you have just as big of a role in that as the leadership of the church does. We need to choose to replant instead of transplant. And when we become okay with the unknown, our eyes will be opened by the hand of the Lord and he will bring us opportunities that we can't even imagine. You consider the choices we have to make or the choices that are before us. We can be exactly content with where we've been. We can be exactly content with what we have always done. Or we can take the hand of the Lord and go with him. Some of you know my story as pastor at Creef Corps Southern Baptist Church, but I want to make sure it was, it's very clear that it was not my original plan to close Creef Corps Southern Baptist Church. I did everything that I could to not close the church. And then when I saw things that I couldn't do, I tried to leave. No joke. I sent out 150 or so resumes trying to leave the church. That way, I didn't have to close the church. I could leave it up to the deacons at West. Appreciate it. We need to look at your resume after services, okay? (laughs) Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. But we try so hard on not to do things. But when I realized that that God was calling me to do the things that we did three years ago, we realized that it was an opportunity to move with him. And because we were willing to move with him, We have seen God move in ways we never thought possible, whether it was in our own neighborhood or across the globe. 
I'm a firm believer without a shadow of doubt because we made the decision to move, made the decision to join with the journey. We were able to start ministries that impacted not only our community through the Team World Vision and, and Global 6K for water, that we were able to draw people and people were actually brought to the church because of that. And they, got, they became a saving relationship with Jesus Christ because of that ministry. But we are also not only just that, but we are also able to send ministry, ministers or missionaries across the world to Tanzan Tanzania. Tasmania. Tanzania. Tanzania. I had it close somewhere. But not just that, but now he's got, we'll have opportunities to go to Zambia. And we had opportunities to go across the United States to help minister and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I didn't think that was possible four years ago. And I just start seeing what the possibilities we have, but it only can be possible if we do this. This next point, the next aspect to our vision, and that is we have to listen to the Lord and no one else. We have to listen to the Lord and no one else. Take a look what it says in verse 22. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them with all resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. So I asked the question, why should we listen to the Lord? After all, don't we know what's best for ourselves? Don't we know what we ought to do? We've been doing ministry long enough. We've been in the ministry for 10, 15, 20 years. We ought to know what ought to work. If I say ought enough, does that sound more efficient? You're fine. Go ahead. Okay, I'm just checking. We think we ought to do. We think we know what is right, but because when we start listening to the Lord, here's what happens. People take notice. We can try for years of broadcasting our stuff about who we are. We put things on Facebook and YouTube, and, and we'll get people by just doing that. We can broadcast ourselves. We've done that for many, many years, but it doesn't mean people take notice. But when we start listening to the Lord... People take notice. Take a look what happens here in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11, verse 22. The news about them, the news about who? About the church in Antioch reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. Let me remind you that they didn't have TikTok back then. They didn't have social media. They didn't even have the printing press back then. So the newspaper wasn't even talking about the church in Antioch. What was happening is people were hearing. People were seeing what was happening. How did this happen? Because God was drawing people based on what they heard and what they saw in the lives of the church. They were seeing transformation take place. And people were drawn to it. News so much of what was going on that word began to spread to the church in Jerusalem. Now, why is the church in Jerusalem important? Well, if you remember back in the early book of Acts, that is where all the apostles were at. That's where they were stationed. That's where they were ministering there. So you got Peter, James, and John, and the other disciples were ministering in Jerusalem, and they start hearing words that some new thing is going on. They're preaching to those people, to those guys. Are, are you sure that's really what should be happening? You, they should be teaching to other people other than to, uh, to those in Jerusalem, to the Jews. Should, should they really be doing that? And so here's what I truly believe. What they were hoping to do is that they're going to send people up there to investigate what's going on. And really, ought to, they try to maybe correct them. I think they've tried to correct us a few times. A couple times. <laughs> what are we doing? Are we ought to be doing something different? So here's what they did. They sent Barnabas up to Antioch. Now, interesting on why Barnabas. Why did they send him? Interesting story about Barnabas. If you remember about Barnabas, Barnabas was the man who brought Saul to the apostles. Now, Saul was the guy who was persecuting the church. He was destroying the church and even killing the church. He was probably, I, th I believe, he was even at the stoning of Stephen. He was there overseeing it. He could have even been the man who was directing all that persecution and all the killing. But then he, we know the story about 
about his transformation where Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and he was transformed. He was saved by the power of Jesus Christ, and God was going to use him to bring people to him. But we, as the people and the, the apostles, really started to question about who this Saul character is. Is this really a true conversion, or was this just a, 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 a way to convince us so then we can actually be killed? So he can betray us and and we can be killed. And Barnabas was the only one who stood up to him, who was the only one who stood by Paul's side and said, trust me, he's been transformed, he's been changed. So Barnabas wasn't afraid of what was going on. So he was going to go up there and investigate, yet something miraculous happened. Look what it says in verse 23. He arrived and witnessed the grace of God of God. He witnessed the grace of God. I want you to take note of this. He didn't do a few things. He didn't write down what kind of programs they were doing. He didn't write down was how well the Journey Kids program was reaching the, young, the, the, the children of the church. He didn't write down to see, well, if you can just do these 10 steps, then that will create church growth. He didn't document any of those things because it wasn't about the programs, but it was about the grace of God. He was seeing God changing lives. What is then the grace of God? The grace of God is the unmerited favor of of God towards us. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not the result of our works so that no one may boast. Our ministries, our programs are simply to be a conduit of the gospel. When he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he did something that the church of Jerusalem didn't probably be expect him to do because he rejoiced with them. He celebrated with them. Church, we need to celebrate the victories. We need to celebrate the fact that a dead man has been made alive, that the man who was now hopeless now has hope. We need to celebrate the victories. Unfortunately, for the church in Jerusalem and so many churches today, we often question the salvation instead of celebrating the salvation. Church, we need to be a church where we celebrate. We rejoice when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ. And then... We encourage them. It says in verse 23 that Barnabas rejoiced and began to encourage them to remain true to the Lord with all resolute heart. We need to remain true to the Lord even in those times of difficult. How can we do that? We have to ignore the world. We have to ignore its distractions, its deceit, its desires, and its destructions. It is a choice. That is a matter of your heart. Who will you remain true to? Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 say these words, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. I believe without a shadow of doubt that when we truly Listen to the Lord and no one else. We will truly experience things we never thought possible. And may we too experience what happens in verse 24. The considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. That leads us to the third point. To intentionally equip disciples for kingdom service. A few years ago would be what a lot of people would consider a successful year in ministry for me. If you could put wins and losses all in a column, you could say several years ago was, well, was four years ago, in fact, was, was there a lot more wins in the column than there were losses? Our church baptized over 40 people that year. 
Our church baptized over 40 people, many of whom came to Christ for the first time, and it was exciting. I felt like we were on track as, as a church. I felt like we were doing what God wanted us to do, and we certainly was. I don't doubt that at all. We certainly was doing what God wanted us to do. But something started to happen after we had all these baptisms. Some people, not all, but a lot of people whom we baptized started coming to church less and less. Stopped taking part in the church. It wasn't as if they went somewhere else. They just, they just automatically just fell out of worshiping God. They just stopped worshiping God. They, they, they wasn't part of, uh, of anything uh, the church was doing outside of Sunday morning. They wasn't part of Sunday morning. They wasn't part of the church anymore. And I'll be real honest with you. I'm very transparent. I'll just lay it out for you. And, and you can do with it what you will. It became very frustrating. And I moved from frustration to anger. And whenever you're in that position, your eyes aren't open to see what God is doing. I'm just going to tell you, they're not. They're not. You start thinking selfishly, which we all have a tendency to do. Then we start looking around for answers as to why are so many people coming, coming through the front doors and we're baptizing them and they're not sticking. Historically, the journey has never had an issue with new people coming. We get new people coming to the church, but, but, but it just, it seems as if they're just, they just would walk away. Now on paper, at a meeting at the association, we were successful. And there were certain aspects of the ministry in the church that I could absolutely say was successful. And I could still say was successful. But we looked around why people weren't sticking. And, and, and there, it was messy because people are messy, aren't they? Relationships are messy. Church is messy. If you don't want to get your hands dirty, you better not volunteer at anything at church. I identified some areas where my lack of follow-up with people was a problem. The things I wasn't doing that I should have been doing as a pastor was a problem. I'm the type of guy that if the Lord, I, th I think if the Lord's talking to me and give me an idea, I will stand up that day and I will throw it against the wall and see what sticks. Eric's not like that, by the way. So he can't go anywhere. All right? Because Eric's the one saying, no, 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 Pastor. We said we were going to do this. We have to do it. Okay. But I started to get the feeling like I was a failure in ministry. Started to get the feeling like, is God really listening to the prayers? Is he really listening? Then I start to then I start trying to figure out how I could preach better on Sunday mornings because if I could just do a little bit better on Sunday mornings, I would be able to keep you guys awake. <laughs> That's for those of you dozing off. <laughs> if I could just preach better, I'd be able to keep... Uh, uh, it would be better for the church. If I could just be a better pastor, it would be better. And Joe Gardner and I had many conversations of, about what we could do. At church, we tried countless programs. The elders grew frustrated. I remember one time, Kurt sat at a table and he set the paper down and he goes, are we going to follow through with this one? And I'm like, dude, I will cut you. But I smiled and said, yes, we will. So when we started this journey together and God planted the seed of coming together as one, when, when God did that and as we come together, I immediately knew that if this is going to work, there's going to be a lot of change that has to happen. We're going to have to do a lot of things differently. We're going to have to do a lot of things differently. There's a lot of things we do that we do well that we need to keep doing well, but boy, there's some things that we need to cut off and get out and get done right, according to what God has called us to do. I was at a, a, a conference several weeks ago uh, with Joe, 
and it was one of those conferences. It was a, it was a Tuesday night. I didn't want to go to the conference. I wasn't excited about being there. I thought there's no way I'm going to be able to stay awake through this, but okay, let's go. It's part of my obligation because we're in this association. Is that honest enough for you? Okay. But I go there and I've never had, I, I've never had like that big epiphany. I've never had that, that big moment. When I gave my life to Christ, I gave my life to Christ and I sat at the side of the bed and nothing happened. I was so disappointed. I thought the light was going to come down, the bed was going to shake, I was going to float, something cool, nothing happened. I felt the same. Thank goodness I don't pastor a charismatic church because they'd say, you ain't saved, brother. But I set in, and when I set in, I realized what I wasn't able to identify for years, family. I wasn't able to identify this for years, for years. See, I spent all of my time trying to get people to come to church and not enough time teaching people how to be the church. That's big. That's big. That's huge. That's ginormous. That's something that we cannot do. We have to be able to make disciples as a church. And if we're not careful, we will become a church who is nothing about, we do nothing but programs catering to under-discipled people. If we're not careful, we'll turn it in to nothing more than entertainment. And when it becomes entertainment, they are far better options than the journey to be entertained by. Far better options. The book Future Church says, we all know the Great Commission found in Matthew 28, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Lord Jesus. We know that, right? In this book, Future Church, it says that the functional Great Commission in North American churches has become go into the world and make more worship attenders, baptizing them in the name of small groups and teaching them to volunteer a few hours a month. Ooh. Ooh. Does that take your breath away? We must be intentional on creating and developing disciples. Verse 25 says, And he left for Tarsus and to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers of people. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. This is very straightforward. It says in ver verse 26, they met and they taught. In other words, they got together and they grew in Jesus Christ. It wasn't some great magical thing that happened. It wasn't some awesome program that happened. It wasn't some cool thing. The pastor didn't walk in with a beanie and a latte and all of a sudden everyone got excited. It wasn't that. I'll never wear a beanie and I won't drink a latte. Just saying. Pull up the slide for me if you would. I'm going to go really quick, really quick this morning. But here's the concept visualized. And I'm a visual person. I learn visually. That's just, that, it's just how God has wired me. So here's the concept. In a church, you have a lower room and an upper room. And the lower room is this. If you're a lower room church attender, you come to church because of where it's located. You come to church because it's a cool building. You come to church because it's convenient for you. If you're a lower room Christian, maybe you come to church, it says personality, maybe you come to church because you have a relationship with one of the pastors or one of the leaders of the church. I like hearing that pastor speak. I like hearing that pastor speak. That's your motivation to come to church. You come to church because you want to hear the pastor speak. You want to see what the dancing clown is going to do the next week. And then you have the next one, and that's programs. They do some really cool things at that church. They face paint. They do all kinds of awesome things. They do all these fun, cool things. 
things, and you come to church because of that. And if you're a lower room Christian and we're simply a lower room church, finally you come to church simply because of the relationships you've cultivated with the people sitting around you. Now, hear me. Wake up and hear me, please. Okay? There is nothing wrong with the lower room. There is nothing wrong with coming to church and those being the reasons you come to church. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you simply exist in the lower room through your faith, and if this church is wired and exists and built around nothing but the lower room, a bad cyclical thing starts to happen. People come in, and when someone they love leaves the church, or when another pastor preaches, or if the programs aren't good enough, they walk in one door and they walk out the other. If we're a lower room church and we commit to being a lower room church, and that's the only place we go, that we stay right there, people will come in and out of this church until the day we all die. And if we entertain enough, they'll stay. There is value in programs. There is value in relationships. There is value in loving and liking the leadership and the pastors of the church. There's value in that. I'm not saying there isn't. Matter of fact, we need to do those things better. We need to do Sunday morning better. We need to do groups better. On Easter, we want to blow this thing up. We want every inflatable in this city out in this, in this yard out here. We want people to stop and go, what is going on there? We want to figure out how we park all the cars in the parking lot because we're out of room. We want those programs. We need those programs. Those programs exist for a reason. But with that, with that, we need to make sure that we're walking people up the steps into the upper room. And we need to make sure that everything we stand for is discipleship making. We must be a church that has a vision for discipling members of Jesus Christ and growing them. Where the purpose for you maybe was the, the place, personality, programs, or people. Maybe that's what brought you to the church. But what keeps you at the church is their unique call to a vision, discipleship-making people. And that's what we're going to do. So we establish the roots. We choose to replant, not just transplant. We listen to the Lord and no one else. We equip disciples for the kingdom. And to close out, Pastor Eric. We talk about we need to foster unity rather than uniformity. We need to foster unity rather than uh, you foster unity rather than uniformity. The, the challenge we have, a lot of challenges churches have as we see growth and we see a lot of people coming and a lot of things going on in the church, we think, oh, that is going great. Everything is going well. Uh, we talked about this lower room and the upper room and, and having a great lower room is, is, is essential. But we have to also know, and, and Will Mancini points out in this book, The Future Church, that there is a difference between uniformity and unity. We can all be uniform, but we can't be united. We, we don't necessarily will be united. I can think of, uh, of the time, one of my greatest times of my life happened my freshman year of college. I was over at Iowa State University and had the joy and the opportunity to march with the Iowa State marching cyclones. I mean, you walked? I walked, we oh. marched, and we played a instrument at the same time. We all wore the same uniforms. We all had the same dinkles. For those who know what dinkles are, that's your shoes that you wear. All right? You had, you had the, the dinkles, and you had your own special hat with a little flume at the top. Dinkles? It was great. Dinkles, yes. We'll talk more later. Okay. Anyway, all right. we all looked uniform, right? We all looked right. But you know what happens when you're not united? You look out of place. 
If somebody plays the wrong song, plays the wrong note, steps out of line, it becomes noticeable. A matter of fact, you, you know you weren't united when, when they're trying to create the video for the end of the year and they were trying to piece together what was the best pregame show out of the entire year and they had trouble finding one where everybody was on the same page and the same lines and the same shape. So many times we think that if we just come into the same place, sing the same songs, sit in the same seats, all look the part, then we are united because we are uniform. But we must realize that we can all sing in unison, but the song will sound lifeless. We can all look the same, but still appear lifeless. I believe that the only way we can truly have unity is by understanding why we are united. I want you to understand this. It wasn't convenience that the two churches came together. Rather, it was about time the churches start coming together. It wasn't out of convenience that two churches came together. It was actually about time that churches started coming together. I want you to take a look at what it says in verse, uh, verse 26. It says, And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Did you see what it didn't say? It didn't say that they were the Jewish Christians and they, they were the Gentile Christians. It didn't say that they were Greek Christians, but they were Christians. We aren't the Richland body. We aren't the journey body. I will even convince you to say that we're not even the journey, but we are followers of Jesus Christ. We are Christians. Wow, took my breath away. We should not be coming together because of the name on the sign or the style of worship music, or the location of the building, or even the pastors in the pulpit. If either of these reasons are why we are gathering this morning, then we will never have unity. Why are we called Christians? You understand? Do you understand what this word Christians means? It simply means that we belong to or followers of Christ. We, are, we, we belong to or we are followers of Christ. Now, how do we know what, what that really means when it looks like? If you were to say we are from Illinois, what are people from Illinois called? Well, I don't want to know now. <laughs> <laughs> we're called Illinoisans, right? We're Illinoisans. If you live in Peoria, you're a Peorian. If you live in God's country of Washington, you're Washingtonians. Oh. No? Because that's where we belong. That's where we live. That's whom we follow. So if we are truly Christ followers, we're not just a Christian. We're not just by name, not just by title, but we truly belong to Christ. And what did Christ ask his disciples to do? He said, you need to pick up your cross and follow him. We don't come together to this building. We don't come together to worship because we are the journey. But we do so because we are the children, the sons, and the daughters of the one true God. We can only have unity when all of this and all that we're going to talk about is about Him. And not about us. We can only have unity when all of our eyes are focused on Him. We can only have unity when we have the peace of Christ and our own lives first. At this time, we're going to have another time of worship where we call it the time of invitation. And, and maybe as the song is being played and you've heard some of these things and you've heard some of the music and you've heard some of these words where, where God is changing lies in Antioch. Where people are hearing Christ crucified. That he died on the cross for the forgiveness of their sins. And maybe you've been walking around and maybe you've been attending church, whether you've been in person or online for the past several years, and you've been just going through the motions. I need to ask you, 
how do you know you will have eternal life? My story is much like the story you can find in the Gospels called the rich young ruler. Because see, the rich young ruler asked the very same question. He comes up to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you know what he said? He said, follow the Ten Commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not lie, do not steal. That was me. I was a good, clean kid, I thought. My mom might tell you differently. But I don't have that dramatic story where I was found in, on the ends of the street where I was you know, just kind of sticking needles in my arms or just trying to do all these drugs or being in a drunken stupor uh, in, in college and, and, and doing all this the weird stuff that they do. I, I, the most cursed thing I say every once in a while is I'll say, but in church, and people say, what happened? Right? But you know what was my life? Because I was much like the rich young ruler. I did not have eternal life. Because I did not know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Because even though we can say that I've done all these things, I've done all the things that I can do as a good church person, it doesn't truly make me a Christian, a Christ follower. Because you know what Christ says? He says, good, you've done all those things. Now sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And that's where the decision has to be at this morning, church. If we are truly going to be a church on mission, a church following Jesus Christ, a church drawing people towards the Lord, we have to be willing to follow Him. Ignoring what the world is saying and say, yes, I'm going to focus on my life and all my eyes on you. Maybe that's you this morning. You've tried to do both. Quite honestly, it's quite exhausting. You've carried the luggage of your life, of your sins, of your pain, of your past around, and your shoulders are getting quite heavy. And it's time to lay them down at the foot of the cross and say, God, I am all yours. Church, maybe we've been doing things way too much, way too wrong, way too long, and it's time to say, God, we are going to surrender this church to you. We're going to lay them down at your cross, and we say, take us. You know what happens when we give in ourselves to Christ? We belong to him. And you know what scripture says when we belong to him? It says he places us into his palm, and nobody can snatch us out of his hand. That's where I want to be. If you're not there, here's an opportunity this morning to surrender your life and ask to be in his hand. We're going to have this song of invitation. I ask if you need to make a decision for Jesus Christ, you come as we sing. If you need to just join us in prayer for our church to ask us to be truly followers of Christ, you come. Whatever you need to do, let's stand this morning, let's worship, and you come.